Four years ago, he chronicled Vancouver's history with drugs and fighting for space, how a group of drug users transformed one city's struggle with addiction. Today, former Georgia Strait reporter Travis Lupik is back with a new book entitled Light Up the Night, America's Overdose Crisis and the Drug Users Fighting for Survival. Welcome to the City News Bookshelf, Travis. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for having me. So a lot has changed in the four years between these two books. Uh, what would you say was the biggest change? Oh, I think it's got to be the intensification uh, of the overdose crisis, um, especially since COVID-19 arrived. Um, Vancouver's been dealing with this crisis for a long time now, since 2014, 15, 16, depending on how you count it. And we were finally beginning to make some progress. I think that the city and the province's harm reduction programs, uh, supervised injection facilities and that sort of thing, I think that they were finally beginning to reduce overdose deaths. We saw a pretty steep decline through 2019. And then COVID arrived and, and the numbers just soared over and above anything we'd seen before. Uh, 2000, 2000 dead in British Columbia last year. Uh, for comparison's sake, uh, from 2001 to 2010, the average annual number was 204. So we're at 10 times the annual average now for that first decade of this millennium, 10 times. And what made you take up the subject again in Light Up the Night? Well, when I finished Fighting for Space, which, which recounts Vancouver's history with harm reduction, primarily uh, the Insight story, the story of the continent's first supervised injection facility on East Hastings Street. Um, I, I, when I finished writing that book and got it out there, I knew that I wanted to kind of continue that harm reduction story. I did, didn't know where to go with it. And when I was touring Fighting for Space in the United States, I, um, I met these two incredible women, Jess Tilly in Massachusetts, Louise Vincent in North Carolina. They were working with harm reduction and, and drug user organizing um, in their respective states and then right across the country. And I, I saw this natural continuation of, of the story I told in Fighting for Space. You know, it's, it's a different geographic region, uh, south of the border this time, and also a bit of a different chronology. Fighting for Space was largely history. Uh, this book is very much rooted entirely in the present. Um, but despite those differences, uh, there is real continuity between the two stories. Vancouver was ahead of most of the continent on harm reduction with things like needle exchange, et cetera. And uh, activists across the United States have, um, you know, I don't want to give Vancouver too much credit for their work, but, but Vancouver has set an example for harm reduction. And so the harm reduction story in North America kind of continues that way um, from Vancouver in the 80s, 90s, 2000s to America in the 2000s, 2010s, and now 2020s today. It's funny you say that because I couldn't help but feel echoes of the uh, of your earlier work, especially when the when the two activists you you follow around in the book start to get organized in groups not unlike Van Du, the Vancouver area network of, of drug users. So it's was, it was kind of there is a continuity there between the two books, as you say. Exactly. And I mean, differences again, the Vancouver area network of drug users was founded in 1997 in the downtown east side. Uh, really, um, primarily by um, street entrenched um, people who use drugs that are really in the throes of chaotic addiction. Uh, most of them were homeless. You know, the first meetings of Vandu were in a public park because nobody would even, you know, let them borrow a room at a community center or anything. Um, the work that Louise and Jess are doing, it's, it, it took inspiration from that, but it's, um, well, it's bigger. I mean, they're organizing at a national level. They, they're, they've established chapters uh, in, different, in more than 20, uh, 25 cities right across the United States now, and they're saying, we want to stay in Washington, D.C. Now, the, the book focuses, as you mentioned, on, on Jess and, and Louise, and uh, as, as the reader goes through the book, you, you really come to care about them as like, not unlike characters in a novel or in a movie. Um, how did you find them? I mean, this was um, serendipity. Uh, I was touring fighting for space, mostly through the U.S. Northeast, and uh, Jess Tilly in Massachusetts was assigned to introduce me at a uh, speech I was making in Boston. And I'd heard the name, but I didn't know Jess. And, um, and we hit it off kind of in, you know, the hour before the, <clears throat> the event as we were chatting, and she told me a little bit about her life. And, and I thought, this is just incredible what you've overcome and where you are today. And, and then she told me more about her life. And, and again, I just kept finding myself saying, this is incredible. And it was something similar in, uh, in Greensboro, North, North Carolina. I was speaking at a church and I'd heard of Louise Vincent and I kind of, you know, I kind of expected her, I hoped her to be there. She's a, she's a prominent organizer in the region. And she didn't turn up. And, and I found that that was because she was in the hospital. And a friend of a friend said, go visit Louise, give me some flowers for her. So I did that. And, um, 
and the scene I found walking into to her hospital room, you know, there's local activists there standing next to her bed who are talking about events that they want to put on in, in Greensboro later that month. And she's on the phone with activists on, on a conference call with activists across the country talking about meetings they're going to hold monthly. And then she's got a computer open with a Zoom meeting in front of her. And she's talking to activists in New Orleans about a march they're setting up later that month. And then her family's kind of pushed off to one side in the quarter, taking notes with these other activists. And she's doing all of this simultaneously. And I'm thinking, my God, I got to learn more about you. So she was kind enough to uh, invite me back out to Greensboro. I don't know if she was just being polite, but a couple months later I was there. And then I found out that Louise and Jess were working together. And, and that actually came much later, that came a bit later in my research process. So I met these two incredible women that I wanted to learn more about and then found out they know each other working together. And uh, from there, um, you know, it's their story that just took off. One of the things I found interesting uh, in, in the experience, in Jess's experience, and this is probably true of Louise as well, and it's a quote from Jess, it's that people always think recovery is either you're completely abstinent or you're in full chaotic use, and there is a world in between, and, and you, you sort of chronicle very well how she has to go between those two worlds, between harm reduction and law enforcement and uh, being eligible for a, for a for methadone clinic and it's not black and white. It's not recovery or uh, or or use. There there is a world that exists in between that that uh, that she illustrates quite well. And this is something that we never talk about. You know that that there is a big difference between you know chaotic addiction and, and abstinence. And a lot of people actually survive in that world quite comfortably. Um, Jess and Louise, you know, um, the prime examples. Um, sometimes they're on methadone, they're, they're in different stages of recovery, sometimes they're still using drugs, but what they're accomplishing cannot be de denied. You know, these are incredibly productive people um, who are holding, you know, national meetings and actually getting the attention of Washington. Um, Dr. Carl Hart, who's a, a, a prominent um, addiction writer and a, a professor at the University of Columbia in New York, you know, that's one of the most prestigious uh, schools in, in, in the United States and therefore the world. And he came up with a book last year called Drug Use for Grown Ups. And this professor of Columbia, who you know, spends his time traveling around the world uh, doing spe speaking engagements, he came out and said, I occasionally do heroin. Uh, you know, he really put himself on a limb there, um, speaking to the exact point that Jess was making. There is a world in between, um, you know, chaotic addiction and abstinence, and it's never talked about. The other interesting thing that uh, that came up for me was seeing this uh, this intersect between feminism and harm reduction, and you you illustrate and and explain quite well how much uh, power a male can have over his female partner, in being able to to shoot her up. Were you struck by this as well? Very much so. I mean, this was one of the points um, that really. Um, one of the one of the many reasons that made me so interested to write another book about women is, uh, you know, people don't think about this dynamic um, that so many women who are, who are injection uh, injection drug users uh, fall into, where it's so often um, a man who injects them and, and they don't learn how to inject themselves, and that's an in an intense power dynamic because you're that person is addicted, they're sometimes physically dependent on opiates, but they don't have control over their opiate supply. And so um, one of the things that Jess and Louise do is actually teach other women how to inject themselves. I mean, that can sound counterintuitive. How are you improving someone's health by teaching them to inject drugs? But for so many women who, are, who have been relying or have been forced to rely on men, um, you know, sometimes pimps, sometimes that kind of thing, um, teaching them to inject is, is, a, is an action of empowerment. You know, it gives them control. It gives them autonomy over their own bodies. And so there's a strong intersection between harm reduction and feminism um, that I think shows that, you know, Harm reduction, um, controversial though it may be, um, has so many benefits, especially for women, even much so much much more so than for men. Another topic you look at as well is the rise of fentanyl and how that's changed the landscape. Uh, and you describe quite well how it's so much more cost effective for traffickers to move fentanyl than heroin. And of course, with far deadlier consequences. And you talk about some career heroin users, if you can call them that, overdosing and dying uh, from fentanyl. Yeah, that's one, you know, one of the most common questions that I get is why fentanyl? You know, dealer, dealers know that it's killing their customers. That's bad business. Why fentanyl? It's economics. I mean, when, it, when a dealer transitions uh, from heroin to fentanyl, the profit margin does not increase by one zero. It increases by a whole string of zeros. Uh, fentanyl is so much cheaper than heroin, not only to produce, but, but, also, it's also, but also to distribute. You know, for heroin, uh, you need a poppy field. You need to pay farmers. You need to hide an entire poppy field, which is not an easy thing to do. 
Uh, heroin is a relatively bulky product, so it's difficult to transport, especially across the high tech border like the United States or Canada. You got to pay off lots of government officials. You got to pay for you know, transport routes right across the continent. Uh, fentanyl, you don't need any of that. You cook it in a little scientific lab in somebody's basement, and it is so potent that instead of you know, smuggling it through this distribution channel that stretches across the continent, you put it into a standard envelope and you send it in the mail. I mean, just, just compare those two processes. Fentanyl is dirt cheap, and that's why we're stuck with it. I think this quite effectively makes the case for uh, ensuring a safe supply of drugs, uh, that and COVID as well. What do you think it'll take for that to happen? Education. Uh, the safe supply question, I mean, I'm thrilled that Vancouver is having that conversation. I know it's early days. Um, it's going to take education. You know, it's a scary concept. A safe supply, we're going to give people heroin. And, and it was originally a scary concept for me. Um, but I think if you accept two basic truths, you know, that people have always used drugs and always will, and that our, our drug supply is now so hopelessly polluted, replaced uh, with fentanyl, even more dangerous substances like carfentanyl, that drug users are going to continue to die of these unprecedented, unacceptable rates. You know, if you accept those two things, I no longer know what we do but legalize and regulate safe supply. Um, it's a scary subject. I think we should acknowledge that. It's a complicated subject. I think we should acknowledge that. There's going to be lots of questions. You know, do we want Pfizer or Purdue Pharma supplying us with cocaine? They don't have a great track record there <laughs> um, with that kind of thing, right? Um, so there's going to be tough questions. We don't know exactly how we're going to do it. We don't know if there might be unintended consequences. Let's acknowledge those, those concerns. But I think what it will do is begin to minimize, begin to decrease these, this skyrocketing rate of overdose deaths. And I think that's got to be our first priority. Are you distressed by what you see happening in Vancouver right now with, with the rising number of deaths? And do we still stack up well uh, against other cities when it comes to harm reduction? Well, the answer to that question is kind of a scary piece of this crisis because Vancouver is so far ahead on harm reduction, you know, more than any city on the continent, almost the world now, really, with the expansion of, um, of supervised injection sites, of safe consumption sites uh, since 2016. You know, we're ahead of most of the world and we were beginning to bring the numbers down. You know, they were falling. And then COVID hit, the drug supply has gone, entered another wave where it's more dangerous than ever. Benzodiazepines, uh, Xanax has entered the heroin supply now, uh, making overdoses more complicated. So the scary answer to that question is we're doing the right things. They're just not working well enough or fast enough. It's a really scary problem that we're dealing with. It's a really challenging problem that we're dealing with. And since COVID, it's only getting worse. Um, and that's why I think we got to talk about scary, scary solutions like safe supply, because at this point, um, I don't know what, what else we do. Um, and we got to keep these people alive. You know, people can have ideological oppositions to harm reduction and they can look down on people who use drugs, but the punishment for an addiction should not be death. I, I think we can agree on that. I hope we can agree on that. And what do you hope uh, people take away ultimately from the book? A couple of things. Um, that people who are struggling with an addiction to cocaine, heroin, whatever, most of them are not having a great time. They're not partying, they're not doing drugs for fun on the weekend. Um, so often, this is the result of past trauma, of childhood trauma, whether physical or sexual, or, um, or it's the result of mental health challenges. You know, we don't give people a mental health care system. We don't really have that in North America. And so we leave people to self-medicate. Sometimes they find drugs and then we blame them for them. So I think that's a big piece of it, that these are not people who are just having fun. You know, they're struggling with the world and they deserve our help. And then the second piece is, is the harm reduction stuff that we've talked about. Um, harm reduction is still a controversial topic, especially in the United States, less, so, less more so in Canada. And that's because of education. You know, Canada and Vancouver especially has been having these conversations for a long time. So um, you know, I'd like an acknowledgement that, that people who do drugs are struggling. Um, not all of them, mind you. you know, some of them just uh, deserve autonomy. I don't know what right we have to tell people they they, they can't do drugs. And that's another, that's another piece of this in a larger conversation. But, um, you know, an understanding of addiction and an understanding of harm reduction. And I think that these two women are just so incredibly generous for sharing those stories to help us understand those things. All right. The name of the book is Light Up the Night, America's Overdose Crisis and the Drug Users Fighting for Survival. It's available from the New Press. My thanks to author Travis Lupic. Thank you so much for having me.